Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who were expecting Catherine Kaufman, my apologies. Uh, she was called away uh, an emergency. Five minutes, OK. And uh, so I'm the, uh, the inadequate replacement substitute for her. But uh, I've been asked to talk generally about American uh, policy towards uh, development, how it's evolved. I'll draw on some of my own experience and then talk more specifically about the American response to Belt and Road based on conversations that I had with Ms. Kaufman's staff uh, this morning. And the new organization, uh, the International uh, Development Finance Corporation, uh, in which she will soon sit. Basically, the United States, of course, ever since the end of World War II, has been very much involved in development. And at the beginning, there was a very large infrastructural component uh, because so much of our focus was, through the Marshall Plan, on Europe, which had a very elaborate infrastructure, at least in the most developed parts of it, that had been destroyed uh, by war. And therefore, much of the American effort was, and the name of the World Bank suggests, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, was to reconstruct infrastructure that was uh, already there, and then moving on as the, uh, third, as the third world became a more important focus of development efforts into the third world uh, as well. But this emphasis on physical infrastructure and the emphasis on international financial institutions, or IFIs, IFIs, like uh, the World Bank, was only one strand of American policy. And I think that's very important in thinking about where our response to the BRI fits into a broader policy historically. Uh, basically, from the beginning, uh, American uh, non-governmental organizations of various kinds uh, were very much involved in promoting development in Asia. An old friend of mine, John Brandon, is here uh, in the audience today, come down from Washington. He works at the Asia Foundation, uh, which is something that today we might call a gongo, a government-organized, non-governmental organization which was set up uh, in the 1950s uh, to provide uh, uh, what we would now call development assistance uh, to Asia. And from the beginning, it's been multifaceted. It began, uh, one of its major thrusts over the years has been human resource development by giving fellowships and scholarships to uh, promising young Asians to come to the United States for study tours, for uh, degree programs, uh, and the like. Uh, there was an emphasis in the early years by the United States on technological exchange, particularly in uh, the Green Revolution in agricultural uh, technology. And over the years, uh, the uh, Asia Foundation has been involved in the development of various uh, institutions in developing countries, uh, legislatures, courts, the media, which was just mentioned, um, non-governmental organizations, civil society, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so the United States has had a very wide-ranging view of what development means, in which infrastructure, physical infrastructure, has been a part, only a part, and I would argue a decreasingly important part. Let me focus on that as the background to basically how China filled in a gap that we helped create in the first place. Basically, when I was in Washington in the 1980s, when I was the dean at the Elliott School, I had the great advantage of being literally a few steps from the World Bank and a few more steps away from the International Monetary Fund. And I was called into several meetings at the World Bank where they were beginning to uh, announce or develop uh, a new focus for uh, development strategy. And this was increasingly under American <coughs> pressure. The idea, perhaps, was still that infrastructure, physical infrastructure, uh, ports, uh, railroads, highways, uh, airports, and so forth, steel mills, and uh, the whole panoply of physical infrastructure may be important, but it was very problematic. Necessary, perhaps, but not sufficient. There was a lot of concern, uh, and um, we've already heard a, a bit uh, about this uh, from Rush about the corruption involved in big physical infrastructure projects. Because so much money is involved, uh, the state in the developing country is inherently involved in much of this. And therefore, as money changes hands, uh, there's going to be people who want their 10% at least, and maybe more as that money goes through. So there was a concern about infrastructure as being a bed of corruption, even though it might still be important. 
same time, there was a growing sense that if, even if it was necessary, physical infrastructure was not sufficient. And under pressure from the United States, first the World Bank and then its Asian equivalent, no, not the AIIB, but its predecessor, the Japanese-led Asian Development Bank, to focus not so much on physical infrastructure, but on what we might call the, uh, the software as opposed to the, uh, to the hardware. And again, this would be many of the things that uh, organizations like the Asia Foundation and other non-governmental organizations have been working on before. You started at the top with policy. A good development policy was just as more important, in fact, than the physical infrastructure. You then begin to work down through the system. What are the institutions that then develop policy? Universities, think tanks that enact policy, legislatures, and all the way down through the system, the bureaucracy, down to civil society. Uh, and then increasingly, in the more recent years, women's empowerment to include more and more parts of society in active civil society. And so the pressure on uh, the IFIs uh, was to uh, focus on that. Uh, I was an advisor to the Asian Development Bank at the time, and I know how painful that was to the ADB, which felt, I use the term mission creep, this was mission race that basically the expansion of the roles and missions of the traditional IFIs was very, very challenging. They were being asked to do things that they had never done before. They were not very, very happy about it. But the United States put the pressure on to do this, and also we, of course, restructured <coughs> our own aid system uh, to make it more conditional, uh, to focus on human rights, on democratization, on infrastructure building, and so forth, and develop new institutions like the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation, which would impose greater conditions on uh, the recipient countries. So what was happening was that as the Asian region's need for infrastructure expanded, uh, as Asian economies grew, as there was growing awareness of the lack of connectivity uh, among many neighbors, the systems had been uh, built by the colonial powers in the case of railroads and highways. Neighboring countries were often not connected at all, except by going uh, by air or by sea to the former metropolitan capital and then back out again. Uh, there was a real sense that you needed more infrastructure in Asia. But the Americans and the institutions that they largely influenced and controlled were now reluctant. Uh, and that created a gap that the Chinese were all too ready for all the reasons that Rush Doshi has just described to fill in. I describe this as scoring own goals. For those of you who, uh, who follow uh, football, or as we call it here, soccer, I'm a football father, so that's how I know about these things. My son was a goalkeeper, and that's the thing you fear most is an own goal, because you're always blamed for it. Uh, but anyway, it was an own goal. We created the possibility for China to move in uh, in a way about which the United States was instantly skeptical and then increasingly critical as we focused on all the problems that Rush uh, so well outlined and tended to ignore or downplay uh, the benefits. But criticizing was not enough. We could call it a loan-to-own scheme or predatory lending, uh, again, emphasizing all the negatives. But you had to have some kind of alternative, uh, and that is what Catherine Kaufman would have talked about had she been able to join us uh, today. Because just in the last year or so, the United States Congress has approved a major initiative of the Trump administration, a, uh, an act of Congress called the BUILD Act. Uh, and of course, as is always the case these days, this is an acronym for a much longer title. Uh, it is a better utilization of investment to lead development. Uh, and its main uh, institutional uh, consequence is the creation of a new government agency uh, called the, and sometimes there's an international in front, sometimes they're not. I'll just use the full term, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, uh, which is the American response to the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, what is this new organization? Organizationally, it is going to pull together uh, aspects of existing institutions and then give them new powers and missions. Uh, it is going to put together the uh, OPIC, which is the uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, 
which is the government agency that in the past has largely uh, done uh, work on, uh, on project uh, assessment, on political risk analysis, and above all, investment guarantees uh, for private companies, American companies, wanting to invest in the third world. And put that together with the, uh, the loan extending uh, uh, agencies of the USAID. So this is going to be a across the board financial institution that will cover both uh, uh, the promotion of private investment and the extension of uh, loans uh, to developing countries. But in addition to combining what already exists at the tune of an, addition, an, an initial $60 billion, we can compare that with the uh, much larger amount of money uh, that the Chinese are putting forward, a $60 billion initial uh, startup uh, fund that will increase every year, as I understand the legislation, uh, according to the cost of living, the inflation in the United States. In addition to creating this uh, new organization and uh, creating an additional fund, uh, this new organization will be given some additional powers and, interestingly, responsibilities. The power it will have is now to co-invest in uh, with American and other, na other countries, multinational corporations, in uh, infrastructural investment. It will always have a minority share. Uh, it will be on the order of 25%, though all these things are still being worked out. Uh, but we will be able to co-invest. And of course, that to some degree embodies the old OPIC investment guarantee. The United States government is one of the investors. And that is since uh, believed to be a way of managing or reducing the, uh, the, political, uh, the political risk. Uh, we will also be able, for the first time, to extend the work of OPIC to the multinational corporations of other, especially allied, countries. Uh, so the idea is that we will bring in not just American multinationals, but to bring in Japanese and to bring in Australians. Uh, and there may be others as well. In fact, Taiwanese were now mentioned today. And I'll come back to the importance of that in, uh, in just a moment. So the idea is that we are going to try to leverage by a kind of matching investment uh, with uh, multinationals, not just from the US, but from other friendly, uh, presumably democratic uh, countries as well. Uh, next is a new definition of what um, uh, infrastructure investment means. Uh, it will be what uh, Ms. Kaufman's uh, staff today described as next gen, next generation infrastructure. Uh, particularly was mentioned 5G, uh, but I think there's probably a variety of other forms of what was somewhat vaguely called software uh, as well as hardware. Uh, and uh, to see uh, it moving beyond the traditional physical infrastructure that, at least as reported, are still the main foci of the Chinese Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And that's to do this through a set of standards which are believed to be world-class and cutting edge. Uh, the United States, when we talk about free trade areas now uh, and free trade agreements, increasingly talk about WTO+. Plus. We want our new trade agreements not simply to meet the demanding standards of the WTO, but to go beyond that. And of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was to have been the Asian regional example uh, of this. Um, in, case of, in, in the case of investment, uh, what we're now talking about is what might be called uh, the uh, OPIC uh, and IFC. Uh, that is the uh, International uh, Finance Corporation of the World Bank, plus. That is existing global standards with regard to uh, transparency and, uh, and uh, economic or commercial viability, plus a range of other standards as well. These may include environmental protection, they may involve labor standards, and uh, what Ms. Kaufman would have talked about because she is in charge of this aspect of it, looking at developments and projects through what she called a gender lens. In other words, women's empowerment. So you can see bringing into this new organization many of the things that the United States was concerned about as it tried to refocus and reorient uh, the IFIs from the World Bank and the ADB 
uh, uh, now to this new uh, international financial uh, development uh, uh, corporation. Uh, we don't know what proportion will be lending and what proportion will be investment uh, because uh, it's absorbing both of these functions from the existing uh, institutions. Uh, we don't know how much actual uh, equity will be put in by the, uh, this new uh, agency uh, together with uh, uh, multinational corporations. We don't know how many of those multinational corporate partners will be American, how many will be non-American. In fact, as of this morning, uh, this new agency doesn't really even have its own website yet. It's just getting started. Uh, and uh, indeed, I'm not even sure that that initial capitalization has been formally approved uh, by Congress. It's close, but uh, you know, there's always that last step that takes a long time to, uh, uh, to, um, to reach. Uh, one uh, last point about this, uh, maybe two, uh, is that, as I said, a, the new organization also has some interesting new responsibilities. What I had not realized until this morning was that uh, the, um, a new set of conditions is being applied, or at least a new set of tasks. And that is that this new agency is supposed to be in close coordination uh, with the National Security Council and other foreign policy agencies of the United States in terms of where it places its priority. Uh, high on this list, and it's conceivable because um, she uh, is an alum of VA and forget whether she took my class or not, but certainly knows my background. Uh, whether this was simply because she knew I'd be interested or what, but uh, Taiwan had a very, very interestingly high position uh, in this new agency's uh, list of uh, priorities uh, in two ways. Number one, there is an attempt to, from the beginning, to draw in Taiwanese government funding and uh, private funding into the investment projects of the, uh, of the um, IDFC. Uh, in particular, a bank in Paraguay, a regional bank that is interested in doing microfinance uh, with a focus on, again, women's, uh, women's borrowing and therefore women's economic empowerment. Um, and uh, that's only one way in which it's being done. Even more interestingly is to use this new agency to try to respond to the Chinese uh, offers of financial aid and investment capital uh, to those countries which currently recognize Taiwan diplomatically, but are about to shift recognition over to the PRC. Uh, so this is really a foreign policy objective uh, uh, that goes beyond simply seeing Taiwan as an additional uh, source of financing. Uh, and cooperative programming and uh, project design uh, for, the, uh, for the IDFC. Um, I asked what the most difficult questions uh, might be. Uh, and of course, this last one could raise all kinds of questions from various sources about the, uh, the kind of the political conditionality and purposes, just like what Rush was talking about for China. There are many motivations here. Uh, but she said, interestingly, there is bipartisan support for the BUILD Act and for the new IFDC. Uh, but it is um, uh, one objection that comes up is almost exactly the parallel to what we've been talking about, about the domestic politics within China. Uh, the skeptics are saying, why is it that you're spending this money, U.S. capital, U.S. Uh, 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 taxpayers' money, on these other countries, why aren't you spending this money to promote investment in the inner cities in the United States, or even more importantly, investing it in American national, uh, national security? So this new agency, which uh, is not really fully up and running yet, uh, it's just being staffed, and as Shirley has pointed out, so understaffed at this point that they couldn't even <laughs> find a substitute uh, to come down to talk to us uh, today let alone, and surely can answer this aspect far better than I can, uh, whether they have the real ability uh, to vet uh, proposals for investment. They do have the OPIC, uh, the OPIC uh, background, but that's for investment guarantees. Now to actually select projects uh, in which to co-invest and to recruit and select and cooperate with and sign agreements with the co-investors 
in these equity investments or loans that are going to be made, uh, we just don't know. So as with, the, as with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the other funding bodies for the Belt and Road, things, when it got started, it wasn't clear how well able China would be able to do. They made some mistakes. As Russia said, they've adapted and they've been resilient. Uh, our new institution is at a much earlier stage, but many of the same questions can be asked about our capability to do it well and how these very different motivations and considerations, the traditional promoting development through investment and the new one of using this as one of our kind of uh, economic tools in our war chest uh, uh, to deal with initiatives by China that we want to turn back or block, all this remains to be seen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Stay here or? Thank you. Actually, it's uh, because we're behind schedule, it's coffee time. Uh, feel free to take a break. Uh, in 15 minutes, there will be uh, the next section. But I thought uh, it would be a good opportunity for those of you who want to break, please go ahead. But we can take three questions, let's say. Uh, they can take a break time to answer questions. And uh, after the next section, they don't get coffee time. After the next section, there will be half an hour of uh, discussion where we can ask all four of them questions that relate to both the politics and the economic section. So, uh, are there questions? Great. Here, first. Uh, could you speak a bit about the differences that, in terms of the challenges that are faced by international development, um, equity investment versus lending? Is there any specific okay, challenges? Okay, so keep that all in mind, mm -hmm. Well, um, I just would like to ask uh, whether you uh, have any opinion on the current situation of Hong, uh, Hong Kong, whether it would have any impact in either China's or America's response. Okay, uh, third question. Yes. Um, it was interesting that you touched on the U.S. backlash against this sort of funding because there's been hints of that in China as well, um, particularly after the COCAC forum. A lot of Chinese were like, why are we investing $60 billion in Africa when we have our own problems at home? Um, so if you and Rush could just speak to the Chinese domestic sentiments towards the Belt and Road. Great. I know they have lots to say about all the questions and just didn't get to it. So um, Rush, why don't you, uh, I think a, yeah, a screen kind of covers, if you both stand in front of the okay. table, um, so why don't we go one question at a time? So, uh, no. I'm actually going to turn that over to my wife because Shirley Lin has worked in these areas. <laughs> well, look, I had a hard enough time channeling uh, Catherine Kaufman to channel Shirley Lin's going to be hard. Uh, but these these are these are two different. I mean, they're related, obviously. Basically, the question is whether equity or uh, or lending whether the project involved produces a sufficient return on investment in order to either pay back the loan, and that's usually very specifically specified in terms of repayment schedule, interest rates, and so forth, or to provide a return on the investment that the equity shareholders expect. So in each case, uh, there is supposed to be a return so that this will be, to some degree, a commercially viable operation. Uh, the problem in general with regard to infrastructure investment of the traditional kind, uh, highways, railroads, ports, and so forth, is that these are very long-term investments. They take years to uh, put together. The Chinese do it more quickly. Authoritarian systems do it more quickly. Uh, but even so, it takes time just to complete the infrastructure and then more time to generate the additional economic activity that is promised, and then the necessity to extract some of that in order to pay back the loan or to, uh, uh, or to um, uh, provide a dividend uh, of some sort to the, uh, to the shareholder. So the whole problem of infrastructure investment to me has to do not only with the viability, the commercial viability, uh, and as we'll hear in greater detail when we get into the economic aspects, uh, these are based on mistaken assumptions about uh, how rationally they would be economically. Uh, but also it's a matter of time frame. Uh, one, uh, one reason that the United States moved away from supporting uh, infrastructure investment by IFIs was that the leadership of the World Bank at the time, uh, again, perhaps under some pressure from the US administration that appointed uh, the director, 
believed uh, that the uh, private sector should and could make up the difference. Uh, and what we found was that very few private sector entities were willing to operate on that time frame. The one exception is pension funds, especially if you have young workers who are going to continue to work for some time before they start withdrawing from their pensions or their 401ks. That multi-decade time frame fits a little better. I guess I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> because I just finished, that, that's how I would answer the question, yes. But I don't have much to add to that. I completely agree. I think uh, it also depends. Not all projects are equally predisposed to equity structures versus debt structures. So it depends very much on the possibility of revenue conversion for uh, revenue generation from the project. Um, but I'm not an expert economist on that, so I'll leave it uh, to to yeah. uh, leave it at that. I guess yeah. I was forced you to add in to because I yeah, please, to do please. it for software yeah. investment. I think the difficulty is, uh, and also this morning's conversation with Opic, I very much wanted to to be here. I wanted us to uh, to make remarks on their behalf, if you will. Um, I think that it was very clear that they're moving from lending to a partially equity investing. And that takes really a totally different uh, capability. And it's uh, but not very clear that actually um, uh, the, that the uh, executive branch actually uh, has been clear about how much we will do. And their initial thought is we will take minority states in um, the Build Back legislation actually mandates that uh, OPEC will be investing um, uh, and lending to lower uh, middle income countries, which is new to them. Uh, and so this has two different problems, and both of them have pointed out. The duration is very long. Private companies is another part. They want to do private public partnership. It's very difficult to find private companies and would want to invest in a lower middle income country in a road uh, that would take 30 years to pay back yeah. and um, take the political risk, the economic risk, the commercial risk, and uh, on top of it, to do good work, like be able to help the women, uh, raise labor standards. And, uh, uh, and have environmental sustainability. I uh, think you get the picture. The challenges are immense. Um, and both in terms of our institutions having the capability to do debt and equity investing, which requires different kinds of talent, and on top of it, to find investors in the private sector who will be interested in those things, uh, and to be uh, strategic in terms of political goals uh, in promoting these, uh, what they call best practice, uh, while they're doing development work. So, second question, Hong Kong, I'll start with Rush. Sure. Um, the, the linkage between Hong Kong and Belt and Road is a complicated one. And the way I think that linkage plays itself, most, uh, plays itself out most acutely is in thinking about Hong Kong's effect on governments that might be considering Belt and Road investment. So what do we know about how Hong Kong has shaped international public opinion about China? We know, number one, that Hong Kong has led to uh, a great degree of focus on China that is negative. It has led to greater focus on this. There's greater focus on Hong Kong in many ways. There are on issues like Xinjiang or other human rights problems that are a little bit harder to see. Hong Kong is on your phone. You can see what's happening in real time. When a protest is shot, that's all around the internet. When something happens in a camp in Xinjiang, we don't know. We don't see it. And it, therefore, it has less resonance. So the fact that Hong Kong is so resonant with people around the world has shaped politics. And how has how it actually transmitted itself to political decision making? Well, it's still early. But I'll say it this way. We've had a chance in my job to meet a lot with uh, European governments that are interested in talking about China. They come to Brookings. We often give them briefings. We ask them what they're thinking. Europe is, in many ways, the swing state, in my view, in sort of US-China competition. Europe is so important to how this competition will unfold. And what do European states say universally? They say that their populaces are very tuned into Hong Kong, not the same way that they're tuned into a variety of domestic developments, but far more than you would ordinarily expect, given that foreign policy generally receives so little attention. And that could affect their willingness to accept Chinese investment. And that is compounded further by the fact that some Chinese investment, we discussed this in the morning, is itself politically problematic. And as we saw in the US just a few weeks ago, there were questions about you know, if you invest in this company, does that contribute to internment in Xinjiang? Uh, that was a question that was, that was sort of raised um, about some companies. If you invest in this other company, will that result in reclamation in the South China Sea of Islands? If you invest in this third company? So, the complexity of those economic relations is getting greater and greater. The political backlash, if something goes wrong, is higher and higher. And the risk is just big. So as a direct result, I think Hong Kong just further accelerates the fact that this has become a big problem for companies and countries that want to accept investment from China. Just add two points uh, on that. Number one, with regard specifically to Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government has now named uh, something called the Belt and Road Commissioner. 
uh, with the idea being that uh, this person would be responsible for uh, basically maximizing Hong Kong's role uh, in the financing of Belt and Road Initiative projects. And of course, Hong Kong is, as Shirley can explain more fully, one of many economies, high income economies in the world that is trapped with slowing growth, uh, increasingly restive uh, youth populations uh, and uh, aging populations at the same time. And so the idea that this would be another way of uh, utilizing the enormous uh, capacity of the Hong Kong financial system, it is one of the world's major financial centers. Uh, this was attractive, of course, to uh, the Chinese government, but to the Hong Kong government as well. So the idea was the Belt and Road Commissioner was to make all this happen. Uh, the problem is, of course, that Hong Kong companies, financial institutions, and multinational corporations are just as commercially oriented as everyone else. And the question is whether the appeals to patriotism to please support the, the nation's Belt and Road Initiative is going to overcome a bad uh, due diligence report about the project in question. That's kind of dubious. Uh, so I think that uh, the wish may not be entirely fulfilled. One other and more general point, one of the things that Rush did not mention in his excellent overview, uh, but I'd like to add here and to say how problematic it now is for China is this. Basically, China, China has been obsessed with the idea that soft power is what is necessary to legitimize the development of hard power. Uh, and that the way that you reassure other countries that China's rise is going to be beneficial is basically to have soft power accompanying it. And I would say that one of the many things that is disappointing to China, or should be, is that developments in Hong Kong are stripping away many of the kinds of soft power uh, that China was trying to uh, develop. Belt and Road also does this in the, in the, in the case of the sense that this is another uh, neo-colonial or neo-imperial power in its investment and trade patterns. Uh, but specifically with regard to Hong Kong, the idea that China offers this model of effective, consultative, authoritarian government that is a counterpoise and superior to the Western model of Western, of a, a representative liberal democracy. Uh, forgive the editorial comment, but this is a government in Hong Kong that is not effective, not meritocratic, and not consultative in the slightest. It is completely an example of failed leadership. So if this is the kind of model, the Chinese model that China is presenting uh, to developing countries, Hong Kong is a disaster uh, for them. I'll just uh, add to what the two gentlemen have not said. So the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is actually something that's very much grounded in Hong Kong, given that, and Rush has written about this in terms of uh, uh, the uh, RMB internationalization, in that uh, when the Chinese, uh, of course, need to uh, finance these projects, uh, it has been trying to finance it using RMB, uh, but what, whether it's through RMB. Uh, uh, for the US dollar, Hong Kong is very important. These liquidity, the biggest offshore uh, renewable um, uh, center in the world. Uh, but more importantly, um, as money goes out, Hong Kong is important, but also more importantly coming in. The Middle East, Southeast Asia, going into Hong Kong to do Belt and Road Initiative was a very important part of the government's uh, uh, thinking. And I've uh, spoken to the Hong Kong government um, about this, and the HKMA actually has a Belt and Road fund and department that has not done investments. So I asked them why. Well, it's very difficult. Can you imagine a highly return-oriented, uh, sort of result-oriented kind of fund? You're trying to tell them we have some political objectives, try to make some investments. Well, you say, well, who's going to subsidize me? Uh, who's going to tell my taxpayers we're making these investments that have returns in 50 years? Um, and so they've been very slow and not picked up. So they decided if we can't pick up, we're going to have a Belt and Road Minister type of person, two levels down um, from the chief executive, to promote it. And I said to them, what does it mean to promote it, to tell people to invest in Belt and Road? Come to Hong Kong to do it, especially the Middle Eastern money. That was one great idea, uh, because that money, a lot of it, couldn't come to the US. And so let's get them and help make investments in Southeast Asia together. The scheme has all been, the thoughtfulness has been quite astounding. But the execution has been, let's just say, underwhelming. Um, and, uh, and I think recently, with all the things that are happening in Hong Kong, it's not giving anybody comfort that through Hong Kong, we can invest 
in Belt and Road, whether it's inbound or outbound capital. So, backlash, domestic backlash, very important. Uh, Rush. Uh, sure. Um, th that's right. There's been definitely widespread concern about the Belt and Road going back a few years, especially as China's economy slows, um, deleveraging slows the economy further. We're trying to, you know, correct for the, the uh, financial imbalances. And then in addition to that, the trade war, all of that sort of a, uh, it provides a kind of a drag on economic prosperity that's kind of new for people. We're now at 6% growth from what historically people were getting accustomed to 8 to 10 to 12% at one point. So, how does that? How much does that matter? Is the question, right? Isn't that the real question? Does it matter that some people are upset? And I think it does, but not that much. I think the mechanisms of accountability through which um, public opinion goes all the way up to the top are fundamentally not that powerful. They want to monitor public opinion to make sure that they don't have too much backlash, too much anger about a variety of issues. But there's not a direct forcing mechanism through which public opinion conveys or exerts pressure that is real and sustained on a leadership. So let me give an example of that, right? One of the best cases would be nationalists in China. There's a lot of nationalists. Because of 30 years, there's been an education that's focused on patriotism, anti-Japanese uh, conflict, et cetera, right? That means that there's a wide, and, and the country's risen a lot. Um, but nationalists still get arrested and sent to prison and detained if they go too past the government line. The government's nationalist, but they don't want people further nationalists than they are, right? And so I guess the point is, in that politically powerful group that has wide residents across society still finds itself being kept in balance, then the much politically smaller group of people angry about the Belt and Road will have even less influence. And so, yes, it exists. And I think the most concrete uh, change that China will pursue as a result will be changing the domestic narrative on Belt and Road. But there's a tension. Because internationally, they want to say the Belt and Road is great. Domestically, they want to say, well, don't worry about the Belt and Road too much. It's not like the biggest thing we do. And so, you know, those two don't always work hand in hand. Turns out, though, if you have some degree of censorship, you can sort of modulate the messages. And I think that's, that's the effort. This would add again that this is part of a soft power initiative. Many uh, Chinese intellectuals and uh, international affairs analysts have been talking, and you mentioned the kind of the uh, uh, the uh, human uh, community, the human community of common destiny, uh, and the idea that this is China offering public goods uh, as well as an attractive model of uh, of development. And so people will be saying not only why are we spending the money there but not here, but they'll also be saying, is this actually doing us any good in the, in the soft power area? Uh, we seem to be uh, losing as many friends as we're making. So I, I have no doubt, because I've heard it, uh, that at least some people are criticizing this and other of Xi Jinping's initiatives. Uh, but Russia's absolutely right. The way that those views, they're blocked on the way up. We know that as well. Uh, and uh, you uh, actually increasingly, not only will it not be heard, but uttering them can be a career killer. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, yes, I think that, uh, you know, in terms of the image of Belt and Road uh, internationally and domestically, Beijing tries to manage uh, in a two-pong approach. So in Chinese, there's so many bilingual, I see a lot of bilingual uh, faces here, I assume. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, the Chinese term hasn't changed, although it was uh, it was uh, the West. Uh, but that's right. right. So it's, it has Georgia. several generations. But English has continued to change because they want to soften sort of the image. Uh, and uh, propaganda is probably going to have a name. But I have many good ideas. So um, on note, please have some coffee and uh, we'll break for five minutes. Yeah, let's say three quarters. Uh, three quarters. Okay. Three quarters. Okay. 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 Okay.